organization called Citizens Campaign for the Environment, which I know many of you are familiar with. Um, but we are a statewide organization, and we have offices all throughout New York State. Um, we have offices on Long Island, obviously, White Plains, Albany, Buffalo, Syracuse. And we just opened our first office in Connecticut, in New Haven, so we're pretty excited about that. And I'm here tonight to talk to you about uh, the Broadwater proposal. And I'm sure everybody is familiar with this graphic. We've been in the fight against Broadwater for almost two years now. We launched uh, our campaign actually in 2004. So I thought I would just give you a brief overview for those who are not as familiar with the project. Um, but Broadwater is proposed for the middle of Long Island Sound. So it would be right off of the shores of Wading River, kind of smack in the middle. And it's an FSRU, or Floating Storage Regasification Unit. And that just means it's a big barge in the middle of Long Island Sound. Um, it would be able to store up to 8 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. And it would be able to send out a billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. There would be a 22-mile pipeline that would be dug underneath the sound and it would connect into the already existing Iroquois pipeline, uh, which goes into Huntington. It would be a floating facility, so it would have a mooring, it would be moored to the bottom of Long Island Sound. And it would be covering 14,000 square feet of bottomlands. Now, as it's moored to the bottom of Long Island Sound, the Broadwater facility would be able to pivot with the wave. So it would be kind of movable, almost like a sailboat moored much, much bigger, obviously, and be able to move with the waves in a circular pattern. There'd be two to three tankers um, coming into the sound per week to deliver natural gas or liquefied natural gas to the facility. And like I said, the facility would be able to store up to 8 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. So, why are we opposed to this facility? Why not place a FSRU right smack in the middle of Long Island Sound? Well, that's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight. Uh, why we're opposed. And we're opposed for many different reasons, whether they be environmental impacts, impacts to our regional economy with our fishermen, our lobstermen, um, or whether they be uh, energy, just energy issues in general. Do we need this energy? Is this the right project? Have we been kind of sitting here waiting for this project to come along? Those are all things I'm going to touch upon. The first one I want to talk about is environmental impacts. So what would be the environmental impacts of this facility moored out in the middle of Long Island Sound? Well, it just so happens that this location is actually prime lobster grounds. Um, and how do we know it's prime lobster grounds? Broadwater has identified it as being prime lobster grounds. And something that you guys may not know is that way back, the lobstermen actually gridded out the bottom of Long Island Sound and sectioned it off. Um, because what was happening is they would go out to, into Long Island Sound to lobster and there would be fights of whose lobster traps there were, of whose territory they were going through. And there was actually stories of once or twice guns being pulled. So we didn't think that shooting each other was going to accomplish much. Um, so they worked out this arrangement. So they have the whole sound gridded out into sections. And each section is for one lobsterman. And it happens, to, and they have the whole sound um, shaded too. So what are the most productive areas? What are the least productive areas? And one of the most productive areas is right where the FSRU would be. Now, because of the nature of the FSRU, it would need to cover 14,000 square feet of bottomlands for that anchor mooring system. So this would be covering up prime lobster habitat. Um, and the one guy whose area that it encroaches upon, he is actually the president of the Connecticut Lobstermen's Association. And he always says two things. He's like, you know, there's two things that I wanted in my life. One was to have a full head of hair. He's completely bald. And the second is to be able to continue in lobstering like the generations before me have. Um, so for him, it's about being able to do what he loves to do and to make a living on what he loves to do. 
then that would be impacting. Now, you're probably saying, so what's the big deal? Um, you know, he, he could just move his area. Just because the episode you was in that area, just move your area out. Well, you can't just move your area, because like I said, they gridded out the bottom of the town. Um, so he can't just move over because that's someone else's area. And what happens in this location, too, is you have trawlers as well as lobstermen. You have fishermen and uh, commercial trawlers. And the trawlers have this kind of lane out in Long Island Sound. So if you move out, you're going to go into the trawlers. And then they won't be able to trawl anymore because they'll throw out their nets and they'll catch it on all the lobstermen's gear. So that would really work. And we're talking about Long Island Sound. We're not talking about a wide open body of water. We're talking about a two shore location. So for us, it's not really offshore. It's a two shore location. It's in between New York and Connecticut. So you can only move out so far before you've reached land. Um, what are some other environmental impacts? Well, one of the other biggest things is I know that you guys have seen this, but you may have not seen this graphic, which is inside of it. This graphic here is from the Coast Guard. It's a Coast Guard map. <clears throat> and what the Coast Guard has done is it mapped traffic, commercial traffic, not recreational traffic, not the sailboaters, not the kayakers, not the jet skis, just commercial traffic for one week in the middle of winter to see what kind of traffic is out on Long Island Sound. And as you can see, all the red lines are the traffic and the commercial vehicles going through Long Island Sound. And it's quite a heavy flow of traffic that goes right through the proposed location area, which is that tiny blue box there. We're not so tiny. Also, when you you notice that all the red lines come in through the sound, they enter through what is known as the race. And it's called the race. Yeah. And it's called the race for its racing currents and its navigational hazards. Um, it's a very small entrance, as you'll see here, the kind of the north fork of Long Island and Connecticut. You have to enter in here. It's really the only way into Long Island Sound through the eastern end. All the commercial traffic goes through. And you'll notice all the commercial traffic goes right through the center of it. And that is because, like I said, it's racing carts and it's navigational hazards. So it's actually called something called Valiant Rock that is right by the race. And it's a huge rock formation that's kind of difficult to navigate around. You have to be careful as a boater not to get too close to Valiant Rock because you don't want to have an accident. So while these um, LNG tankers are going to be coming in, they're going to need a no public access zone around them just because of the nature of the material that they're carrying. Um, this no public access zone would be two miles in front, a mile in back, and 750 yards on either side. This no public access zone, as it moves through the race, essentially closes off all traffic in the race. Now, Broadwater has said that the no zone, no, no public access moving zone um, takes about 15 minutes to pass any one given point. Now, if you think of yourself, if you're a charter boat captain and you're taking a bunch of people out for fishing, and yes, the race is actually very well known for fishing um, because of this unique characters that make up the race. So you're a charter boat captain, you're going out to the race because it's great fishing grounds, um, you get out there, everyone's throwing out their lines, they're having a great time, and all of a sudden you get notice from the Coast Guard that you have to move. And you have to, you know, pick up your gear and you have to move out of the way because the broad water LNG tankers are coming through. So now, I, yeah, I'm fishing, I gotta reel up my equipment, I gotta bring up all my stuff, I gotta make sure all those people have done that, and I gotta move my boat out of the way. I just can't move into Valiant Rock, so I pretty much have to move out of the race, move over, wait for the LNG tankers to come through, then move back to where I was and have people put down their lines again, put out their equipment. If I'm on that charter boat, I don't know if I'm gonna be coming back. If I paid out, if I paid to go fishing and half the time was moving out of the way and moving back, um, 
that's not really good for the whole industry. Um, so again, this is an uh, economic problem, and it's also a way of life that we know here on Long Island. These are activities that, that's why we're here on Long Island, so we can go out on the sound, so we can go fishing and boating. You're also going to have a no access zone around the facility itself, which will be a 1.5 mile radius around the facility, where you won't be able to fish, lobster, sail, um, kayak. And this no public access zone will be enforced by armed security guards 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's something that we've never seen on Long Island Sound. We've never had this open section, this open water body of Long Island Sound closed off for public access and public recreation. There's also um, a bunch of different water problems that we would face because of the broad water facility. Um, one thing is how is the facility going to impact uh, fish larvae and fish eggs? It's going to have to intake water. Um, for cooling, even though it's a closed loop system, it's still going to need to take about 5.5 million gallons per day into the facility to cool itself, and then it will discharge that water back into Long Island Sound. Well, when you take that water in, there's going to be some kind of screens or something on the facility, and what happens, and it's not just CCE saying this, but it's scientists that have reviewed uh, the documents and it's agencies like NOAA, federal agencies um, like the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation that has concerns that these screens are going to intake fish eggs and fish larvae um, and that's going to impact the ecosystem of Long Island Sound. So it's actually estimated by some of the state agencies that Broad water would actually intake about 49.8 to 101.9 million eggs from Long Island Sound, killing them. And then about 67.4 million uh, larvae, fish larvae. So this is a lot of consequences uh, for an already stressed ecosystem. Also, like I said, the water would be used for cooling. So when the water is discharged, it'll be discharged at a warmer temperature. It's estimated to be about 3.6 degrees warmer than it was when it came on, which may not sound like a big deal to you guys, but scientists and researchers on Long Island Sound have said that a two to three degrees difference in water temperature could be detrimental for Long Island Sound. And what happens is when we have an increase in water temperature on Long Island Sound, um, the warmer waters are great for invasive species to kind of flourish. And something known as the sea squirt, which covers the bottom of Long Island Sound, covering all the benthic organisms and your crabs and your lobsters, actually flourishes in warmer water. And what they've seen is that the invasive species will flourish and our cold water species will not do as well, like our lobster, which is a cold water species, like our winter flounder, which is a cold water species. So we're not sure how this temperature change would affect the ecosystem of Long Island Sound, um, and we don't feel that there's been enough studies to, to say that there's no impact, because we believe there would be a significant impact. Not only would the warmer the water be warmer, but the board water would also have to use a biocide um, to run it through their pipes. So they would be discharging this chemical back into the water. Again, what kind of effects is that going to have on our fish life, on the eggs, on the larva, um, on the benthic species? We're just not sure. What's the biocide? A biocide is just a chemical, usually a chlorine. The board water facility. Although they like to tell you that LNG is cleaner, it is still a fossil fuel. And a fossil fuel still burns, it still has air emissions, it still has sulfur dioxide and particulate matter and nitrogen oxide all coming from it. So how would this additional air pollutants into our atmosphere affect us? 
um, Nassau County and Suffolk County already do not meet federal air quality standards. We're already in areas that just don't meet the federal air quality standards. Um, so now you have broad water coming in and you have additional air pollutants going out into the air. So how is this going to affect um, our air quality? Now, broad water, being so smart, they decided that um, they weren't going to actually release any air data when the draft environmental impact statement was released. So there was nothing on air data in the draft environmental impact statement. Then, a couple of months later, um, we pulled documents that Board Water was asking for a, an exemption. And what they were asking for is they have the FSRU in the middle of the sound, and then they have that 1.5 mile security zone around the facility, and they were saying, you know what, you shouldn't really count any of the air pollutants in that vicinity because people aren't going to be able to access it and you know it doesn't matter so only count the air pollutants that are outside that area we said no no you can't do that you can't ask for an exemption to freely pollute I, when you have um, a new power plant go up they don't get the option of we're just going to pollute on our property here so I would just like to say, air moves. <laughs> Dude, we all took, you know, basic chemistry, basic biology. Air doesn't just stay on top of your facility. Your pollutants just don't stay there. They move. Um, so we don't believe that they should get that exemption. Um, and like I said, it's not just us that have these environmental concerns. It's the different state and federal agencies that have these concerns. And the different scientists that have reviewed this document that have similar concerns. In Connecticut, they actually held this panel where they had a bunch of scientists come on and review the document and then report to the Connecticut legislature on the document. And one scientist sat up there and he said, you know, I read through this document and I have to tell you that if this was my undergraduate, undergraduate student that submitted it, he would have flopped because this document was so bad. Now, this was the draft environmental impact statement that was supposed to look at all um, the environmental impacts that board water would have. It didn't look at any of the air impacts because Board Water didn't submit that data. And the impacts that it did look at, it really glossed over. It really didn't go through and look at them in detail and do their due diligence and the due studies that they needed to do to evaluate the project. Now, one of the professors that sat up there in the Connecticut Task Force, they said, you know, I'm reading this document and you're citing literature that's outdated. There's been new studies done since then, and the studies you use are outdated. They also said, um, you know, when you evaluated the lobster population, you used a different lobster population because you said that the lobsters would migrate, and they wouldn't be there in the winter during construction. But all the studies on Long Island show that the lobsters stay there and they don't migrate. They're not like other lobster populations. Um, they're their own lobsters. They're their own species. We have own studies on them. Um, so you need to really look at the specific area and the specific studies done for that area and use them. And not just use general studies that you found and you pulled out. Um, I touched upon this a little bit, um, but again, industrialization of Long Island Sound. This is the first time that we would have a facility sited in the open waters of Long Island Sound that would literally go into the middle of Long Island Sound, kind of state their flag and say, okay, this part of the sound now belongs to us. I'm sorry for all those who thought you were it was a public resource, but it's not anymore. It belongs to Shell and TransCanada, two multi 
billion dollar national corporations. Um, and as well as it belonging to us, you are no longer able to access this area. You are no longer able to kayak in this area, fish in this area, boat in this area. If you're a sailboat in fog, you better have a good navigational system because don't come in this area. This is now ours. And that's the first time that we've seen such a public resource being turned over to a private multi-billion dollar corporation. So it kind of opens the doors for what's next. After Shell and TransCanna have, have come in and have you know, staked off their little piece of Long Island Sound, maybe Exxon wants a piece of the action and they'll come in next and stake off their own little piece. Or maybe it's McDonald's. They need a little piece of Long Island Sound for whatever they need it for. Um, we're really opening the doors and setting a precedent where we can't go back from. Because once the doors are open, the doors are open. Do we really need this energy? That's the question. Broadwater has come in, has launched this project, and they say that without their energy, we're done. We're not going to be able to turn on the lights. We're not going to have heat. We don't know what we'll do without their energy. Well, I don't think that we as Long Islanders have been kind of sitting around this cafe, twiddling our thumbs saying, wow, I don't know what we're going to do for energy tomorrow. I hope some big national company comes in and tells us what we're going to do. Gosh, I hope they just propose something to get us out of this dilemma. I don't know if our lights are going to go on tomorrow. We're much smarter than that. And we've actually done some planning. We've actually realized that our energy demands are growing. And we've looked to create infrastructure to support that. Um, just recently, we've seen that Neptune Cable has come online. And that's the first cable of its kind that actually connects uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey to Long Island. And it's a pipeline. It's actually an electrical uh, cable. And it provides 660 megawatts of electricity to Long Island. Enough to power 660,000 homes here on Long Island. We have the Crosstown Cable, <clears throat> which connects Long Island to Connecticut, which is able to provide electricity. Um, we have some projects in the pipeline. But before I go into them, I just want to let you know where this um, natural gas or this liquefied natural gas would be coming from. It would be coming from places like Iran, Qatar, Algeria. We're in kind of this place where we're trying to not addict, re-addict ourselves to another fossil fuel. We're trying to look towards more renewable energies and homegrown energies and energy independence. And how are we going to provide energy for ourselves without relying on foreign countries to provide it for us? Broadwater likes to say that this project is going to save us money. Well, I don't think that people in Iran and Qatar and Algeria are waking up in the morning saying, wow, today I feel like providing America with cheap energy. That's what I want to do. That's not happening. And we know that's not happening. Because in April of 2005, there was a very private meeting that was held with 12 of these LNG countries that, were produ that produce uh, natural gas. And they held this meeting to talk about ways on how to keep the price of natural gas relatively high. And when asked if they were going to be forming something similar to the OPEC countries, they said, not now, but we can't say that for the future. We have to keep our options open. These countries are not going to be providing us with cheap energy. Broadwater also uh, has this magical number of 1 billion cubic feet of natural gas. And I say it's a magical number because they came in and they said they were going to supply the region with 1 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. 
And then when the draft environmental impact statement came out, um, as part of the draft, you have to look at alternatives. And all the alternatives that were looked at were looking at can they provide the region with 1 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. And we have to question, is that what we need? Or is that what Broadwater is telling us we need? And the answer is, we don't know. Because what we need is a comprehensive energy plan that looks at everything and takes everything into account um, before making decisions like, you need a billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. Where did that number come from? What is that number based on? These are all unanswered questions that still today have not been answered. Why do we need one billion cubic feet of natural gas per day? And why should each project be weighed upon whether or not it can produce one billion cubic feet of natural gas per day? Um, as we all know here, it's best to, diver to diversify our energy sources and not to rely on one source for energy. So not to rely on one project, but maybe to make uh, smaller projects that would be less intrusive. Um, for instance, the Islander East Pipeline, which would be a pipeline that would provide natural gas to Long Island from Connecticut. It wouldn't provide one billion cubic feet, but if that pipeline was built, and then we had um, a renewable energy projects on Long Island built, and then there was an upgrade to the Iroquois, an already existing pipeline, to upgrade the capacity of that pipeline. All these smaller projects could add up to what we need, if it is one billion cubic feet, or if it's less than that. The draft did not do this. It just looked at whether one project could provide one billion cubic feet of natural gas. And for us, we really want to see a comprehensive energy plan. Let's sit down, let's look at our different options, let's see what our real needs are, let's look towards energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, other projects that we have in our region, and let's develop the right energy plan for Long Island. Not just take the first thing that comes along, because the first thing that comes along isn't always the right project. There has been a bunch of LNG projects proposed all throughout America. Actually, 52 projects in all. Out of 52 projects, there's five already constructed, most of them are land-based projects. There's 25 of them that have already been approved by FERC. There's four that have been approved in Canada, four that have been approved in Mexico, and 14 projects that are under review. 52 projects in all. Now, you might be saying, wow, that's a lot of projects. Do we need all of that energy? And that would be the right question to ask. Because back in 2005, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission said that we probably need, as a nation, 8 to 10 LNG projects. 8 to 10 LNG projects. And there's already 25 approved projects throughout the U.S. Okay, so that's the U.S. What about in the north? Um, east section where we live. Maybe those projects are all built out in California. Well, they're not all in California, I'll tell you that. But let's look at our section. Well, Massachusetts recently had um, an FSRU proposed, a new FSRU uh, facility proposed for Massachusetts. And the residents there said, you know what, this project is not right for us. So what the developer did is they came back to Massachusetts and they're instead uh, using what's called an SRB technology, sub-regasification vessel. And what that is, it's a pipeline that lays on the floor, and this one is actually in the ocean. It's, uh, there's two of them. One's going to be 13 miles offshore and one's going to be 7 miles offshore. It is on the bottom of the ocean floor and the LNG tankers come in this pipe, pipeline, comes up to meet the LNG tanker, hooks into the LNG tanker, the LNG tanker offloads 
the LNG or the natural gas, it regasifies the gas, the LNG to natural gas, water flows that straight into the pipeline, and then when it's done uploading, it leaves and the pipeline goes back down. Much less intrusive technology. Um, it, can be done, it's being done in Massachusetts. So why can't something like that be looked at for this region? Well, it can. New York State actually has done a report where they looked at alternative locations for the groundwater facility and alternative technologies. And what they found was that groundwater could be sited outside of Long Island Sound. It's very possible to site board water in a different location. Um, they looked at wave activity uh, in the Atlantic Ocean and they found that there are feasible sites and board water could use alternative technology. That technology would be feasible in the Atlantic Ocean with taking in our current and our wave activity. So has board water started looking at these different options yet? No. There's actually been, and still talking about this Northeast region, there's been two LNG projects that have been approved for Canada. Now, the first project would be able to supply a new uh, supply of natural gas to our region, just like the new Massachusetts project. That natural gas, again, goes into this region. So it would be a new source, a new supply of natural gas to tap into. One of the projects in Canada has actually been canceled because the facility could not secure uh, shipments of LNG coming into it. That was a problem because there are so many facilities being built and there's a limited number of LNG and you have to secure and make sure that you can get LNG to your facility. So that one was canceled because it, it couldn't secure uh, LNG to the facility. There's also CCE actually did a report, and it was called Meeting Our Energy Needs Without Broad Water. It started to look at all the different options and the different projects in New York, and um, it looked at the Island Reese Pipeline, which is right now, it's a proposed project, like I talked about, that would connect New York and Connecticut, and would be able to tap into the uh, new Massachusetts project, so it would be a new form of natural gas coming to the area. Um, that right now is kind of held up in Connecticut politics. Um, there's the Iroquois expansion. The Iroquois pipeline is an already existing pipeline that goes from Connecticut to New York. Um, you, they're looking at expanding that pipeline to increase the flow of natural gas to the area. Um, there also is repairing our old power plants. We've heard a lot about that recently. We have some pretty old power plants here in Long Island, and we can repower them, make them more energy efficient, um, cleaner, burning power plants. And that's being looked at right now by LIPA. They're looking uh, to repower at least one or two of the plants. Also, wind energy. Uh, New York currently has about 247 megawatts of wind throughout the state and an additional 900 megawatts of planned projects throughout the state. Um, so taking into different sources of wind energy, uh, energy efficiency programs, energy conservation programs, all of these need to be looked at and evaluated. Uh, there's also a new proposal for an LNG island off of the South Shore, uh, which would be able to supply 1 billion cubic feet of natural gas to the region, and actually could be expanded to 2 billion cubic feet of natural gas for the region. Is any one of those energy projects the best energy project? Um, is the answer? I don't know, and probably not. Um, but we should look at all of them, and we should look at all the puzzle pieces that we have and be able to develop a comprehensive energy plan that works for us as Long Island. Not just go with the most intrusive, um, most destructive energy project that is out there. So, where are we in the process? What's happened? Um, what's coming up? Uh, where are we? Good thing you asked, I'm going to tell you. Uh, Broadwater released their proposal uh, back in 2004, I think it was November 2004, 
And since then, there has been a draft environmental impact statement released, which the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, helped draft. They released that report. There was several public uh, hearings on that, and there was huge public outcry. Um, there's been over 60,000 signatures submitted to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission opposing this project. Thousands of people came out to the public hearings to voice their opposition to this project. We, we were at the uh, hearing in Lading River. People had to park their car like a mile away and walk to the school to get to the public hearing. Um, to have their voice heard because there was so many people there and there wasn't, there was no parking left. So we know how the public feels and the public does not want this project. The public does not believe that this project is going to save them money, um, is the answer to their energy needs. Um, we found actually that the opposite is true. And the public very much opposes this project. So right now, we're waiting for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to put out their final environmental impact statement. They were supposed to put out their final environmental impact statement back in the summer. And what happened is they didn't put it out, and we reached out to them and we said, you know, why haven't you released the final yet? And they said, well, there's been so many comments that we had to go back and we had to research um, much more data and we had to answer all of these questions that we weren't expecting that we had to do. So it's going to take us a little bit more time um, to, to draft the final, which was good news because at least we know that they heard a little bit, even if they didn't listen to us wholeheartedly, um, they had to go back, we had to go make them work. And I feel good about that. We had to go back and, and make them work and do their job. We haven't seen the final yet. Uh, we're waiting for the final to be released. Once the final is released, there'll be another chance for the public to voice their concerns and voice their opposition. And we're also waiting for New York State to weigh in. Now, we know the public in New York State and how they feel. Um, and we also know how many of the elected official, officials feel about this project. We've seen Senator Clinton stand up and oppose the project. We've seen Senator Schumer stand up and oppose the project. We've seen the Long Island delegation of the New York State Senate stand up and oppose the project. We've seen several uh, assembly members stand up and oppose the project. Whole towns have passed resolutions in opposition of the project and have actually hired legal staff um, to have on hand in case they need to go forth with um, ensuing board order and go forth through the, through the legal round. Suffolk County has opposed board order and has hire, hired legal staff. Uh, the town of Huntington, the town of Southville, the town of Riverhead, the town of East Hampton, the town of Brookhaven all has opposed board order. So, who are we missing in this equation, you might ask? Hey, who are we missing in this equation? Thank you! <laughs> We're missing our very important Governor Spitzer. He's been very quiet on this. And when asked about it, um, he says that he's reviewing the documents. We don't feel that Governor Spitzer should be very quiet on this. The people have spoken. The elected officials have listened to the people and they've spoken. And now it's time for the governor to speak and for the governor to stand up and oppose this project. Now, we were in Albany and there was, we actually, there was about 60 people that came up to Albany as part of the anti Broadwater Coalition, which is a coalition of over I believe it's about 80 groups right now, civic groups, um, environmental groups, fishing industry, commercial industry. Um, <coughs> and we went up 
to Albany to have our voice heard in Albany on this project. And it just so happened that Governor Spitzer was, no, he was there. And I don't think he planned to be there either. But he was, we were holding our big kind of press conference rally and he was uh, down below us. We were on the balcony and he was uh, in the well. It's called the well in Albany. So we, was, we were holding our press conference. We discovered that he was there to speak at Dairy Day. And we made sure that we were loud enough that our voices projected over the balcony and down into the well. And he heard us. And he was in the middle of his speech on Dairy Day, and he looked up, and these people were screaming from the balcony. Um, and then the press was there, and they ran down, and they were like, Harvey Spitzer, how do you feel about Broadwater? Um, and he said, I'm reviewing the documents. Well, he's had enough time to review the documents. Now he needs to stand up and be a leader and take a stance. The Attorney General in Connecticut. Connecticut is very, very opposed to this project. The Attorney General is so opposed to this project that in the middle of January last year, he partook in the Burr Water Plunge. And that was when they, with the Polar Club, ran into the middle of Long Island Sound in the middle of January um, to state their opposition. And the Attorney General did that. Now, Senator Lieberman, who also opposes the project, he was at that event, but he chose not to take the plunge. <laughs> I don't know what that means. He still opposed them. So now we're waiting on our governor. Now, the one thing that you guys must do is on this trifold, we have some letter writing tips and we have the governor's address is to make sure you write a letter and you state your opposition and you submit it to the governor because he has still not come out. <clears throat> and actually the state has to make a very important decision known as the coastal zones. It's called a consistency decision and it's through the coastal zone management act. What's all that? Let me explain to you. New York State has to look at the project and has to decide whether or not the project is consistent or inconsistent with the current uses of Long Island Sound. This seems like a very easy decision for us because we know what the current uses of Long Island Sound are and none of the current uses of Long Island Sound are private companies coming in, taking a portion of Long Island Sound taking it as our own, creating public no access zone, telling us we can't fish there, telling us we can't uh, sail there or kayak there or jet ski there or, or any of that. But the Department of State in New York State has not come out with this uh, ruling yet, this consistency ruling. So we're still waiting on them to come out with, with the ruling and we're waiting on the governor to come out with his position. I think that these two are connected. Um, so we also have the Department of State, the Secretary of State, her address here as well. So make sure that you write a letter to her as well as the governor stating your concerns and your opposition. Um, the state was supposed to come out with their ruling in November, November 13th. And they just recently has, have asked for another extension. They now have until uh, February 12th to come out with their decision. Um, so they still have a few more months. Uh, we hear that they're waiting for the final environmental impact statement to be released so they can review that document before coming out with their decision. Um, but we really feel that there's enough information out there already to determine that this project is not consistent with Long Island Sound, with the current uses. It's not consistent with our way of life, with our cultural and economic uses of Long Island Sound. Um, so for us, this is very, very clear. Um, the governor should stand up, oppose Broadwater, and claim 
it is not consistent with Long Island Sound. For us, this project is not only about Long Island Sound, <clears throat> but it's about our way of life here and our way of life in New York. We put up with a lot on Long Island. We put up with traffic, high taxes, um, you know, affordable housing, that lack of affordable housing. And the one thing that keeps us all here is because we get to be close to the water. And because we get to have that experience close to us. That we can hop in the car, and if there's no traffic, be at any given water body within 10 to 15 minutes. And we like that about Long Island. Whether we like to walk on the beaches, whether we like to go swimming, whether we like to go kayaking, whether we're a boater, or we just like to jump on a charter boat and go out fishing. For us, that's our way of life. And that's what really keeps Long Islanders here on Long Island. Because it's not the high taxes, it's not sitting on the LIE to get to work in the morning. Those are the things that we don't like about Long Island. <clears throat> so we want to keep the things that we do like about Long Island. And I don't think that's too much to ask. I don't think it's too much to ask to say, you know what, this project doesn't work for us. Go back to the drawing board and bring us something else. I think we get to say that. So now we have to make sure that we relay that message to the governor and to the state so they understand and they say it too. And now I'll take any questions. Sound study group weighed in on this. You know, there was a commission established about 15 years ago. Yep, the Long Island Sound study group. <clears throat> CC is actually a member of that group, and that's um, it's sort of it's run through the Environmental Protection Agency, which is a federal agency, and it has a host of different um, municipalities, government officials. Um, stakeholder groups um, on it and they do not take positions on projects so they have not weighed in on it. They actually created an ad hoc board water committee which we headed up and we produced a report for the Long Island Sound Citizens Advisory Committee members uh, that we distributed we provide them with updates as the process goes on. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, they did not have to see the, the DIS, the air quality data. Uh -huh. Were they forced to go back and put it in before they and have hearings on that? Or well, that's something, the final? that's something that we uh, actually called for. We asked for to have additional hearings when that uh, air quality data was submitted. And they have not done that. Oh, they haven't? <clears throat> they haven't. Um, they'll be including it in the final, and I believe that you can go onto FERC's website and you can pull the documents that Boardwater has submitted to date um, to look at them. But like I said, the last uh, documents that we pulled, they were asking for an exemption to not include in their analysis the balloons that would be around their facility. It just seems that that's a very faulty document to make. You know, a draft is supposed to have things in it to begin with so people can review it. And to then put it, that stuff in a final, and yeah. a final, to me, it's, you know, it's really not. To you and me and a lot of other people, too, um, the draft was very, very full. The other question I had is, at one point you said um, the national, um, they predicted that we needed 8 to 10 um, national facilities, and now they're saying, you know, they've already approved 25. Why are they going back and saying now that we need so many? What is, what is, what's the reasoning behind it? There is no reasoning behind it, and it's a great question, and one that we have asked through several different documents that we've produced. Um, if we only need 8 to 10 facilities, then why are they approving? 
so many? And why are they letting applications still come in? And unfortunately, as they're set up, they can only look at one project at a time and review one project at a time, whereas they should be set up to review holistically the picture and based on need and, you know, real facts, decide through that. Um, but that's that's not how they work. Great. Thanks for having me. Go get a